Prayers on Monday will um, be largely from France to date, but some of the questions will have words in them that occurred in the first three weeks of the course, so I'd pay you to take a look at that. Second uh, thing is that somebody asked me about, um, in one of the sections, about um, analysis and scores, and I said there is a table in Hilgardia that shows scores for different amounts of total acid, and I never could find it. It's on page 538, whoever I mentioned that to. It shows total acids in table wines and total acids in dessert wines and has some scores, suggested scores. And from your the discussion of the different types of wines and the acids and so forth, you should have a fairly clear picture now of alcohol versus body, uh, volatile acidity, versus the accession score, how do you spell accession, of total acid versus the total acid score. Of uh, SO2 versus the off SO2 order, both free and total. And um, uh, reducing sugar values, <coughs> the sweetness, and something as to what low, medium, and high means in each of these cases for a specific type of wine. And the one that I didn't give you before, which I, is new now, would be the tannin contents versus the astringency. doesn't correlate very well in the case of white wines. If you get a white wine that's been fermented on the skins and it has something like 04 or 05 percent tannin, yes, it will begin to taste astringent. But since almost all commercial wines in California are only 01 or 02, we never really reach this threshold for a tannin, or very seldom reach the threshold for tannin in white wines. So that correlation won't work very well. But in red wines and rosés, it works quite well, at least at the extremes it does. Uh, any wine that has a total acid of point, uh, 10, excuse me, a 10 of 0.2 to 0.3 will be very harsh. Or we call it on, the, on this sheet over here, it will be rough. Very rough. And when they're from about 1, 2, up to 2, they're still going to be somewhat harsh. But red wines of 110 and below will begin to be softer. And most of our rosé wines will run about 07 for the rosé. So if you had a rosé wine like a Green Olino from Italy, which is a low-color variety but a high tannin variety, that would be unbalanced on the American market. You might also have an old red wine that had a high tannin content. That would be unbalanced for an old red wine, 0.2 or 0.3. Because as the red wines age, you want them to come down to something in this range in here. And rosés, you want them to come around in this range here. So there's some rough correlations and with your reading and what you have in the laboratory and so forth. You should be able to figure out some of those. I don't think there will be a question at this time on the labeling choices of California wineries, but I think I'll have to introduce that subject quickly and uh, say something about it. Uh, by law, <coughs> you have to be either generic, proprietary, or variety. And they call something semi-generic. Why, I don't know in the law, but we just call them generic. This would be things like claret or rind and so forth. Proprietary, well, silver satin is a, or 
Thunderbird. Those are both proprietary labels owned by some person. Dubonnet is a proprietary label for a French aperitif wine, or uh, beer is another Dubonnet, is another French proprietary one. And then this would be all the different varieties that uh, you have. That's the first choice that they have. The second, of course, is the year or not the year. They must put the alcohol content on. And it is true, I just looked up the regulations day before yesterday, it has to be plus or minus 1.5 from the value state. So if the value stated is 12, it could be as low as 10.5, and it could be as high as 13.5, and conform to the labeling requirements for alcohol. For dessert wines, it's even bigger than that, but that's all we need to worry about here. Um, it can state produced, and bottled by, and several other requirements of that kind can be put on there. Just bottled by, or finished by, and bottled by, and so forth. It can have a district, which has to be 75%, the district. American would be 100%, of course. But then it could be New York, or California, or Napa Valley, and so forth. How does a district name come about if it's not a... That's a very difficult not? question, because it, the government says that the district must have been recognized. Well, how are you going to have a recognized district when it's a new district? That big fight is going on on Spring Mountain right now. Uh, one man had a little winery and he called it Spring Mountain Wine, and now he says since the district wasn't recognized as a district, nobody on Spring Mountain can call their wine Spring Mountain because he's already copyrighted the name Spring Mountain. So there's a big lawsuit on in that. There was a long time when the government did not permit them to use Livermore on the label because Livermore was not recognized wine district at that time. It's, it's really not very clear how the government comes to these district labels because how are you going to have a, a district label if you, uh, it's not recognized. I notice that they've given an exception for uh, the uh, Monterey uh, Santa Clara label, which Mirasu is using now. That's a new district that never existed before. How they got that through, I'll never know. But that's the district. Yes? Where is there a list of these districts? That's a question I can't answer. I just don't know the answer to that. White Institute would probably provide you with one if you needed it real badly, but they might. There's no reason that says the government has to, to do this. It's only the man who gives label approval. So the Internal Revenue Service Label Approval Department in Washington, D.C., would be the, the depository for this information. And I don't think there's anything by law that requires them to reveal the information. So if you saw it on a label, you would, would write them and ask what the others were, and you might get an answer. Another question? Yes. Yes, why is there so much leeway on the outcome? Is it usually a business question? I, no, I don't think that was the, the question. What difference does it make as long as it's below 14%? That's all they really were interested in. They just, the only thing the Internal Revenue Service is interested in is collecting the revenue. They, 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 that's the reason they've made the requirements for, for volatile acidity that I gave you, the maximum and so forth, because if the volatile acidity is over those limits, the wine, they won't sell any wines and they won't collect any revenue. But the law is very specific that they are not doing this to improve the quality of the wine because they have no authority to do that. The Internal Revenue Service has only a statutory authority over the collection of the revenue. So the, the legal maneuver by which they set limits is because if they don't set these limits, people might produce wines that were higher in volatile acidity than that. They wouldn't sell any wine, then they wouldn't have any revenue to collect. It's a legal myth, but that's the way they, they is operate. Is that true in Europe, too? No, in Europe they're setting standards because they claim it affects the quality directly. The taxes are not quite so burdensome in Europe on wines as they are in this country. In some cases there's practically no tax on wine in Europe. So the, they have direct laws in which it's written out that this affects the quality. But our, and that's true in California also. The state of California doesn't collect any uh, very small taxes on large properties and some WAB money they collect, but uh, they're not interested in collecting it. In California, it's directly because of the quality. But that's not true of the federal government, because of the revenue. It's quite
quite a different thing. All right, now uh, that's all the announcements I had. The other one is I need to have a show of hands four times. First, how many are going? I've given you all the outlines for next Friday. How many are going, by whatever method, on Friday morning? Can I see your hands? And I'll count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. There's 24 going in the morning. And how many are going by private car or getting there otherwise? 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't recommend this. It's against my express wishes that you do that. I can't prevent you since you're uh, 18 and above. For, <laughs> for legal reasons, however, I have uh, given a disclaimer, and we've got it recorded on the tape here now, that I don't recommend that anybody go on their own, for obvious reasons, I think. It's uh, pretty clear. But if you have to go by yourself, you will. How many afternoon, how many are going? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. And how many of those are going by private car or are going to be over there already? 1, 2, 3, 3 by private car. All right. That's all I need to know about that. Now, what I have to lecture on is on the lecture outlines today, and we will go over them uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, wine by wine. Uh, in first, the, the general problems of white table wine production in California are still tied up with the temperature fermentation and the ripeness of the grapes. More probably could be done and settling. These three things, as I see it, are the primary problems. The, the yeast problem is non-existent. Most people know how to use SO2, although this afternoon some of you will get a jolt on that. <laughs> and um, they should know anyway. And um, uh, the aging problem is, seems to be under control, except occasionally, as I'll point out in a minute, too much uh, wood character. But the other things of getting the wines fresh and fruity onto the market, that has to do with the settling, the low temperature fermentation to retain as much of the varietal character as you can, and picking the grapes at the right time, those are still too often neglected. Let's consider Chardonnay, first of all. The industry most often, but not always, calls it Pinot Chardonnay, as most of you know. It's not difficult to identify, so there is no excuse for not having Chardonnay grapes if that's what you uh, want. With low temperature fermentation, there's been a considerable problem with sticking. In fact, in general, Chardonnay producers have had some problems with clarification. Uh, and uh, the result is that uh, we recommend that the grapes be picked uh, with um, a ripeness of around 23 to 24, quite ripe. And that would involve some risks because it's, some, it's a fairly early ripening grape. And if you wait till it gets to 23, you may run into a hot 107 degree period in the Napa Valley or in Sonoma Valley, as far as that's concerned, and then all is going to be lost. We also recommend settling of Chardonnay because of the difficulty of clarification. If you settle, the problem of sticking is worse. The clearer the juice, the more difficult it is to finish the fermentation. There's a little part of that in the table wine book about that and then Professor Sean Darrell has a whole table of that in one of his books. Uh, low SO2 use and the use of the SO2 at one time, not several times, so that you produce as low a fixed SO2 as you can. The minimum fixed SO2 will be achieved when you add the SO2 at one full dose. The maximum fixed SO2 will be achieved when you add a SO2 in small amounts in several doses because it will fix the acetaldehyde as it's being formed in alcoholic fermentation. This sticking has led to some Chardonnays on the market that are not dry. Now, I have no access to the standards of performance of the industry. If they are making them not dry because that's the way they want to make the wine, then that's one thing. If they're making them not dry 
because somebody didn't finish the fermentation and they would rather have finished the fermentation, that is another matter. And uh, I, it seems to me that Chardonnays should not be sweet. And with any degree of uh, technical skill, you ought to be able to finish the fermentation. One way of doing that would be uh, to add a higher amount of, of, of yeast culture to start with. With low temperature fermentation and a large yeast inoculum, you ought to be able to run the fermentation clear through without sticking uh, and uh, uh, with a, a good dry wine at the end. And you're still going to settle, however. Even, even though that slows down the rate of the fermentation, you're still going to settle because the Chardonnay doesn't clarify very well if you don't settle. And this problem of clarifying the Chardonnay introduces the problem of oxidation. If it doesn't clarify, then you've got to filter the wine. The Chardonnay is a fairly delicate flavor. And the more you filter it, the more you're going to injure the flavor of the Chardonnay. So the settling is a part of getting the wine clear. The addition of extra yeast is a part of getting the wine dry. The addition of low SO2 is a part of getting the wine finished fermentation with a low fixed SO2. I've said 22 and a half here or more. I would say 23 if I were going to. Now, the more or less wood aging, that's a subject of great, shall I say, delicacy in California at the present time. There are those people who put a lot of money in uh, to buying French oak or memel oak or Middle European oak and other kinds of oak, and uh, obviously have a very big interest in uh, the question of Chardonnays with an oak character in them. On the other hand, for my personal uh, taste, it's a foreign character in a white wine to have an oaky character. And although I will admit, if forced up into a corner, that I don't find the oak flavor to be in itself, per se, bad. I just think it's not appropriate. It's, if Duke Ellington is playing music, it's all right to have syncopation, but if you're going to have a Beethoven sonata and you start syncopation in the middle of it, you're going to find something wrong about it. And it might be all right to have some wood in an old sherry or an old Madeira. Uh, it might be all right to have a little bit of wood character in a, in a wine that's been in the wood for three years, like a Bordeaux red. But to find an oaky character dominating the flavor of Chardonnay is to me inappropriate. But I must say there are two points of view about that. Now the, the color should be, if it's going to be ripe, you're going to have plenty of yellow color. It has quite a bit of flavon and flavonol pigments and these will, uh, in the small buried variety that Chardonnay is, will show up right away. So whenever I see a Chardonnay that doesn't have any color, I think of two things. One, that the Chardonnay isn't Chardonnay. That worries me. Or second, they pick the Chardonnay too soon, and it's likely not to have very much Chardonnay character. You remember when I described the difference between Chablis and the uh, district of White Burgundy district, that uh, that was the difference, that Chablis don't have a very distinctive flavor, and they have a high total acid, whereas the Chardonnays have a very distinctive flavor. Now this flavor is variously described. We're lucky today to have one in class that has a quite characteristic uh, Chardonnay character. I call it the ripe grape smell. And that is also uh, uh, under a different name is the general name that they give for the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay character in the, in the Burgundy district. When the grapes have just had a little shriveling, passillorage is what they call it, uh, when they've just shriveled a little bit, that's when they consider the flavor to be at its maximum and the sugar content not too high. If you want a little tiny bit of raisin character perhaps, but not accentuated so that you would say that it was a raisin character. Now other people say it smells like a cantaloupe to them and all kinds of things like that. Semantically, I don't know how to help you out very much on the Chardonnay. There is a little description of Chardonnay in the wine and introduction for Americans, as I indicated before. Those represented some wide-eyed, dreaming things that we went through to communicate with people, but I, apparently they haven't caught on very much, especially the, the, the green olive smell of Cabernet. That didn't catch on at all. I think we didn't do ourselves a bit of good on that. At any rate, so much then for the Chardonnay. 
I think we've done pretty well with Chardonnay in California. Perhaps, with the exception of Gewürztraminer, the best of any of the white wines in California have been Chardonnay. Uh, there haven't been as many as I would like. The prices have been rather high. But when they've done their best, and when everything has worked out all right, they've been wines of great character. There have been some excesses performed on Chardonnays besides the wood character. Uh, there are at least two or three very expensive Chardonnays on the market that are far too dark, in my opinion. They've been fermented on the skins in order to get some of the yellow color, or more of the yellow color out. There's one, at least, that has an amber color, which I think is just sherry-like. There's a couple of them at $9 a bottle uh, that are, frankly, quite sweet from stuck fermentations. And the stuck fermentations have led to bacterial contamination because they've been sweet and then the wine has a sweet sour smell of sauerkraut uh, going on in the wine and one or two of them have been gassy from the same reason of the stuck fermentation for that reason I am quite definite in favor of dry Chardonnays not slightly sweet Chardonnays because the, the dangers are too great of the things I've just mentioned and I would like for them to be a lot of flavor in them and, uh, and of course brilliantly clear and with as low SO2 as possible. If you put SO2 in it, you're not going to have Chardonnay very long. You're going to have SO2. These are in no order of quality. That just happened to be the first one and I'm going to have something to be said about the Sauvignon Blanc and the Gewürztraminer as the other two varieties that I have a special affection for. Yes, sir? Do you recommend Chardonnay on the skins? No, I don't. For the reason I've just given. If you leave it on the skins, you're going to get so much yellow color and it's going to turn uh, brown before it gets very many years of age on it and you're not going to get much uh, bouquet out of it. Now the Semillon has an unfortunate habit of overcropping. And in overcropping, uh, the, uh, at the end of the season, the leaves will lack moisture and they will draw moisture from the grapes so that you have these berries that are shriveled and green, as I pointed out in class this morning. And this tendency to overcrop, which I've mentioned here, makes it difficult to get grapes in the right stage of maturity. Because once they've got to this stage where they're drawing great water out of the grapes into the leaves, it doesn't do you any good to leave them on the vine. It's worse to leave them on the vine. You might as well pick, unbalanced though they might be, and hope to get some other semillons that will tend to balance them off. The, uh, Picking should not be as late as the Chardonnay, somewhere around 22, 22 and a half, depending on how many acres you've got and how fast you can get them off. Those are factors. It's been made both dry and sweet, and I like them about equally well. I see nothing wrong with the dry semillon, although in the Napa Valley there is a big prejudice against dry semillon. I think due to one or two people who have said that it has a bitter aftertaste that the semillon has a bitter aftertaste. I have not found this bitter aftertaste myself. I, I think it's just the accentuated semillon character that they're complaining about rather than the bitter aftertaste. Nevertheless, it's quite true that there's not very many dry semillons been produced in the Napa Valley, although there is a fair amount of semillon grapes available. And the sweet semillon still has the semillon flavor. This is an aromatic flavor quite aromatic, almost spicy in some cases, particularly when the grapes have gotten ripe. How do you tell when semillon grapes are completely ripe? Where's all our viticulturalists here now? By looking at them. What does a ripe semillon look like? Yes. Well, that's not quite, the, they get, it's true they get more yellow. They don't really get darker because they're, they're green and then they go to yellow. They have a russet color. They get pink, as a matter of fact. A real, real ripe semillon will have a pink. If you look down on the bottom of the, of the vine and look at the semillons that started to ripen first, you'll see that they're quite pink. So you can tell pretty much by visual means, without even a uh, refractometer, something of the how ripe the grapes are getting if you find those russet colored or pink russet colored semillons. If the grapes are ripened properly, they will make a good dry wine with this aromatic, fig-like uh, smell to me. 
but to you maybe some other kind of smell. There is a semigon we're going to have today which is both sweet and has an aromatic uh, character. And the color will be uh, quite good. It won't be as much as the Chardonnay, but it will be a fairly good color. So if you see a uh, very light colored semillon, is the same doubt will arise in your mind. Is it got enough semillon, one, or two, uh, has it been bleached out with SO2, or three, has it been picked from green grapes? And the surprising amount of this overcropping of semillon in region four. Uh, you see less of this overcropping in region one and two and three, but uh, one of the worst cases of overcropping of semillon I ever saw was down at Manteca, 50 acre block of semillons, which was literally just green shriveled berries, the whole thing. They hadn't got enough irrigation water in and they got some hot weather and the semillons just never did ripen, even there in borderline between region four and five. All right. In spite of that, I have never tasted a really great semillon in California, what I would consider to have the finesse and the bouquet and the aroma like a Chardonnay can have and like Sauvignon Blanc and Gewürztraminer can have. The white Riesling is one of our failures in California as far as I'm concerned. The number of successful white Rieslings has been rather small. It's not just a question of harvesting, however, although there has been a tendency to pick or white Rieslings too late. Picking them too late means that they lose their greenish color and they tend to get a, a hydroxymethylpurphoral or caramel look because they're very subject to sunburning. The characteristic of white Riesling vines is they don't have an awful lot of foliage. You can, you can just go down the road and you can see all the foliage on Sauvignon Blanc and all the foliage on those big Chardonnay vines and all the foliage on Semillon vines and then you get to the white Riesling and it looks like they're half denuded and you can see the clusters hanging on the, the vines of white Riesling whereas you can't in the other varieties or not so easily. So that it gets lots of sun and if you get hot weather it gets lots of dark brown color and they're not so very good. You certainly should settle and you should certainly practice low temperature fermentation and in general, I think that oxidation has been the death of a lot of our, of our Rieslings. They've gotten a little dark in color, and so then they add some more SO2. In essence, I think I would handle white Rieslings more under fermentation traps and under great care of oxidation than any of the other varieties. I think that would help them uh, more than anything else. We don't get polyphenol oxidase, PPO, in California very often. But we have had it a few years uh, in Sonoma, particularly around Santa Rosa. We've had quite a lot of it some years. Whether they should be slightly sweet or whether they should be dry is a matter of personal choice. I don't find anything wrong with the Riesling being sweet. I just don't want to drink as much of it when it's sweet that it, when it's dry. So for me, it would seem to be we should have a little bit more... Um, of the dry character, but many people believe we should have the sweet character. Now that you're stuck between the devil and the dark blue sea on picking white Rieslings, because if you pick it too soon, you don't get any linalool or any of that complex muscat group of compounds, not just linalool alone, but several others. And if you wait too long, you're gonna get the oxidized caramel dark color effect. So uh, maybe, maybe just uh, luck and finding the right place to grow Riesling is why we haven't made as good a Riesling as we should. In general, I would say that California white Rieslings lack fruitiness. They don't have that flowery-like character that you get in Rieslings from a cool region like Alsace or uh, Germany. And certainly it shouldn't have any wood character. This is one place where it's entirely inappropriate. If the Riesling has a character, it should not be complicated by adding wood character to it. All right. Pardon? Well, maybe. Now, for many years, I said the best white wine made in California was made from Sauvignon Blanc, and I have just recently changed my opinion, or grown up, I suppose, is what's happened. Although I still think some of the best wines I've tasted in California have been Sauvignon Blancs, particularly some of the early Sauvignon Blancs from Livermore. I thought were just beautiful wines that aged for a long time. 
You have to have the grapes ripe, and this is not too hard. It's a very vigorous growing vine, produces a huge leaf surface, and eventually, if properly trained, will produce quite good crops, although it's not, the clusters are rather small. It's generally very easy to ferment and easy to clarify, and uh, you're trying for an alcohol content of around 12 to 12 and a half percent. Even, it has perhaps a wider range of satisfaction in California than the other varieties. I think it's disastrous to see Chardonnay going into Fresno or Semillon going into Merced. Whereas I wouldn't think that about Sauvignon Blanc. I, I, would, I would regret it. Uh, I might, um, I might uh, question it, but I wouldn't find that the results would be so disastrous. This variety seems to keep its character through a fairly wide range of climatic conditions. Uh, and it may be that it should not be grown in Region 1 at all. Uh, it may be too accentuated. The Sauvignon Blancs that we collected at, at San Luis Obispo, which is Region 1, and Santa Cruz, and some in Sonoma, seem to be too accentuated in the Sauvignon Blanc character. And this may be one problem in this upper Salinas Valley with Sauvignon Blanc, is that it, it will taste too spicy. It has a very aromatic, spicy character. Um, some people have said it has a Cabernet-like character, and I believe that will be correct. When we finally identify the Cabernet character, I believe you'll find that some of the same compounds that are in Cabernet are going to be in Sauvignon Blanc. It's very easy to age. It's not difficult. It doesn't go brown too soon. It has very clean grapes as they come to the winery, so you don't get very much mold. And in general, uh, I find that uh, it's a very well-balanced wine. Now, just where the word well, I know where Fumé Blanc came, but why it had to be imported into California, I'll never know. But the, it seems like they needed a new name to sell Sauvignon Blanc, so they went to the Loire and got Fumé Blanc as a name. It's the same variety. As I've indicated, a few are too tart, and there are a few that have been blended to lack the spicy character. The blending I can understand from the economic point of view, but can deplore from the quality point of view. For some years, I said that Gewürztraminer was a failure in California, uh, that it was uh, too hot in California, and that either you got, uh, you had to pick the grapes too soon before they developed the Gewürztraminer character in order to keep them tart, or if you waited until you got the Gewürztraminer flavor, they went too flat, and then you had to add too much citric acid to them to balance them all. And I would still say that that's a possibility and that's a danger. But as you learn to live with a variety of grape longer, you learn to, how to handle it better. And uh, so now I see that the Gewürztraminer's coming from Salinas seem to me to be very well balanced and quite be much deal better than some of the earlier Gewürztraminer that I've seen, and even the ones from the have seen, and even the ones from the Napa Valley uh, seem to me to be better today. They have enough Gewürztraminer character or spicy character. It's a Muscat type of character and uh, they are not too flat. Or if they are flat, they're not as flat as they used to be. There was also a problem for a while that they were picking them too late and they were getting brown. Uh, at least two of the Napa Valley Gewürztraminers had several years of bad color because they were waiting to pick in order till they got uh, the spicy character. What does a Gewürztraminer look like when it's right? How can you tell it from any other variety we've had so far? all of our 105 students here and so forth. It's real russet colored. It's, a, it's an amber russet color and you even in just pressing it off the skins, if you don't settle, you get little pieces of skin of this russet and you'll get too much color. So this is another variety that must be settled. Not so important for Sauvignon Blanc, but it certainly is important for Gewürztraminer. Settle them, low temperature fermentation, whether to acidify or not and when to acidify has not been determined. Most people are acidifying during the making of the blends and so forth after the wine is made. It might be better to acidify earlier. And uh, this is another variety that has to be kept on the reduced side, like the Riesling. It should be handled under fermentation traps or carbon dioxide or nitrogen, not be exposed to the air, and early bottling is desirable. I've had some uh, recently some Gewürztraminer uh, one and a half years old from, um, well soon will be one and a half years old, from 
Salinas that would seem to me to be very nicely balanced wines. Now the Emerald Riesling has a deceptive green appearance and it's very easy to allow it to get too ripe, particularly down the valley. It looks green and people think it's not ripe. At 24 bricks, it will still be green in color. Just a part of the nature of the Emerald Riesling. Unfortunately, as Berg pointed out, and as he will be lecturing on next quarter, it and the Pinot Blanc have the greatest tendency to brown of any of the California varieties presently cultivated. And this has had a very uh, difficult effect on it, particularly Emerald Rieslings grown in region four and five, which was where the variety was developed for. We developed Emerald Riesling as a high acid grape for regions four and five. And yet when we grow them there, uh, uh, we get this um, uh, tendency of the um, must to get brown and also the, to be very murky. Uh, so as on the market they're usually blended or quite often they're blended. There are not very many Emerald Rieslings on the market at the present time and I think that's because they have had these pronounced tendencies to brown and the difficulty of uh, the murky uh, must of getting a good fermentation uh, although it's not too bad as far as that's concerned. The Earlier successes were all sweet. And because one of its parents is muscat, and it has a muscat character, dry emerald Rieslings tend to be a little bit uh, bitter. That's also characteristic of all muscat varieties. If they're dry, they tend to have a slightly bitter character. Um, so that it might be better to, at the moment at least, uh, in the main regions where it's grown, in region four, uh, that it would be finished off with a little bit of of sweetness. The flora, we haven't had as much experience with the flora as the other varieties up above, but it has a somewhat of a tendency to darken also, probably from its uh, muscat character. And it's not as aromatic as the Gewürztraminer. It will supplement rather than supplant the Gewürztraminer. There are quite large plantings of Gewürztraminer going along, being planted right alongside a flora. It does have a better production than Gewürztraminer and the sugar acid balance is better than Gewürztraminer. So that in that respect, it's an easier grape to grow and it's an easier grape to ferment. It's not devoid of, of a spicy character, but it's not very, or aromatic character, but it's not very easy to get. There's very little Pinot Blanc or Malone grown in California. Anybody know the reason for it? Well, there was not a, until we got heat treatment for getting rid of viruses, there wasn't a single virus-free vine of either one of these in California. It's the only variety where we couldn't find a virus-free vine someplace in the state. They were all infested with it. And uh, so, that, but now we have some virus-free Pinot Blancs. It ha as I just indicated a while ago in Berg's study, it and the Emerald Riesling were the two varieties that darkened most easily. They have very high tannin content. This one particularly has a high tannin content. And one of the problems you have to worry about is getting too much tannin into the wine. So people who've handled them at their best, well, you used to have it before they got, got too virusy and had to pull it out, they preferred to use only the free run from this variety. And uh, that kept out some of the browning characteristics and made the wines less tannic. Uh, we recommend now that it be crushed very rapidly and and drained off and pressed as rapidly as possible for it. It has a um, um, character different than the Chardonnay character. It's, um, it's medium distinct, not, not very high distinct. I would say it was like a less amount of character than the Chardonnay. It has less of that spicy character of the Chardonnay or the ripe grape character of the Chardonnay. Sometimes it's not picked late enough, I must admit, and that makes it no character at all. Now the Sylvaner is a grape that I have certain reservations about because it ripens very early. It's often too low in acid. And even under the best condition, it doesn't have a very distinctive flavor. It's pretty hard to recognize the Sylvaner in Alsace or in Germany. And it's the lesser quality variety there. And it certainly is a lesser quality variety here. Do we need another neutral flavored variety uh, for California conditions? 
So as far as my conscience is concerned, I think we might be able to do without the Sylvaner. Uh, we certainly don't need very much more of it. And the same thing is true of the Veltliner. Veltliner is an Austrian grape, very large clusters. There are several different clones of it, the red, white, and the green Veltliner and so forth. But they all are characterized by very large winged clusters. And the clusters are fairly tight so that in wet years you get bunch rot. They are very subject to bunch rot in wet years. Furthermore, they don't have very much of a flavor. It doesn't have a distinctive flavor or not. So like Sylvaner, I don't see that it has very much of a place for California conditions. It might be fun for a grower to grow a little bit of it, but uh, other varieties can do it just as well. The Chenin Blanc is somewhat like, I said like, but I think I would change that now, is somewhat like the Veltliner. The Chenin Blanc uh, does not have any pigment. It's always white, whereas the Veltliner, more often than not, has a pink blush or a green russet blush. Some of them are just green. There's a lot of clones of Veltliner. There's only one clone that I know of of Chenin Blanc. It doesn't have a very distinctive flavor. If you work with it for quite a while, you can recognize it, but it's pretty hard to recognize uh, Chenin Blanc. It's a good producer. It clarifies very well. It's a very easy wine to handle in the winery. You crush it, ferment it, it settles clear, and you're ready to bottle it in six months. Uh, it, this lack of a distinctive flavor has recommended it as a sparkling wine cuvee to make into sparkling wines. It's much better in the sugar acid balance than some other varieties in the San Joaquin. And so it's now being used widely in region four for that reason. As I said to the morning class, however, I, I hope and pray that we don't have a wet September in the near future because it's very subject to bunch rot in years of high rainfall. And we've had a lot of problems with it in the Napa Valley for that region. reason. So that uh, I think Chenin Blanc is a good workhorse of a variety with some risks. The risk mainly being of whether bunch rot will develop in it under conditions of high humidity. French Columbar is the presently recommended variety for Region 4 and doesn't have the bunch rot problem that Chenin Blanc has. So many people are planning French Columbard alongside Chenin Blanc for Region 4 and 5 conditions. And they're probably the two best varieties that we have at the present time for that purpose. Uh, the wines are well balanced. They have good acidity. At, uh, um, until the sugar gets up to 22 or 23, even in regions 4 and 5 which makes them unusual. Probably also makes them unrecommendable and they should not be grown in region one and possibly two. Now I know there's a lot of French Columbar in region two in the Napa Valley, but I also know that it has to be blended out when used for a champagne stock because it has too distinctive a flavor. It, it tastes or stinks like French Columbar. French Columbar doesn't have a very ideal smell when it gets very ripe. And so I think it ought not to be planted in regions where it develops its maximum character. And probably the regions that it's best adapted for are regions 3, 4, and 5. Well, just in passing now, some varieties that are not recommended and I don't think make very good wines. The worst of these is probably saint Emilion, uh, also called Uni Blanc, or sometimes called Trebbiano. Uh, this is a real dream of a grape to grow. Probably isn't another variety that I could accept Thompson seedless that will outproduce us and produce it in good condition. It has real long clusters. How can you tell Saint Emilion? No, this one's not red. <laughs> huh? Well, a little bit more than that. How where are they ragged? No. <laughs> They have two little wing tips down at the bottom, or two, they divide usually at the bottom of it, so you see two ends to the cluster. They don't always do this, but often enough so that you can use it as an identifying characteristic. <coughs> but first of all, it has no flavor and has bad sugar acid balance. It has bad sugar acid balance. It, uh, by the time it gets to 20 uh, in regions 3 and 4, 
it's too low in acid. It's not only lacking in, in character, but it produces a rather watery type of character. And it's, if they could just get rid of it in Italy and southern France, they'd be a lot better off. But it produces 10, 12, 14 tons to the acre. It's a great big producer. And as I say, it's a grape grower's dream because it grows very easily. It doesn't rot. Clusters hang down. They're very easy to pick. It's an ideal picker's grape, too. Not like French columbard, which is rather hard to pick. But uh, saint Emilion is just, you put the box under it and it goes snap and you've got a box full of grapes. Burger is another neutral flavored variety, beloved of California champagne producers because it makes very brilliant wine very quick. Burgers were crushed last year. Uh, some of them are already in the bottle right now. Uh, they, they make a very light wine with no special flavor, and in some cases in making sparkling wines, this is what you want. It's a good producer. Very thin skin variety, paper thin. The thinnest skin of any variety that we've talked about today, possible exception of Sylvaner and saint Emilion. So that uh, it, it's a little hard to pick to keep from losing some of the juice, and of course it bunch rots in years of high humidity. There's still a little bit of it around, particularly in the Lodi district. Very high yields. Late L.K. Marshall, I think, took off 16 tons to the acre two years in a row from a vineyard down at uh, beyond the other side of Lodi. Sauvignon Vert is, uh, the bees like Sauvignon Vert too much. It uh, has a muscat character. It's not a Sauvignon at all. We don't know where the word Sauvignon Vert comes from. It doesn't exist in the European anthropology. The bees get into it very early, and you get bunch rot from secondary infections from partially eaten up berries. Now, I know the bee people say that bees never do any damage, that when a bee attacks a grape cluster, he just takes out all of the pulp and he leaves just the skin. Well, that's a, if I was growing bees, I'd say the same thing. But uh, it's not really true. If you go by a Sauvignon Vert vine, after the bees have gotten through it, you'll smell acetic acid, sure. So if you pick these clusters, it, they do look like they're just shells of, of grape berries there. The bees have eaten all the inside out of it. But the bacteria have been along to finish off the job, and they unfortunately don't get every berry on a cluster, so the, the pickers will pick the cluster, and you also get then acetic acid. They brown very quickly. They have a muscat character. They're unbalanced in sugar and acid ratio. And that's one thing that we can claim some credit for here at Davis, that we've just about shamed the Sauvignon Verde out of the Napa Valley. <laughs> Not quite, but almost. I wish we'd had equal success with Green Hungarian. But unfortunately, we seem to have lost to the American public on Green Hungarian. Green Hungarian is another high producer, very poor sugar acid balance, and no character at all. Not even the most avid enthusiast of green Hungarian has ever said that it had, a green, had a, a green or a Hungarian character or any character as far as that's concerned. It's a very neutral flavored variety like saint Emilion. I think what got it is just what got the American public on cold dock, green Hungarian. It must be something romantic. Cold dock, it must be something I need to have. And... Uh, and so they made a splurge for it. And last year it sold at $300 a ton on the lower slopes of Spring Mountain. Now that is to me just a, a perversion of values. Uh, you ought to pay me people to, to keep it, not to crush it. <laughs> now I want to say something about what's probably more important than everything I've said before, and that is the generic types. There is in all three editions of the technology of winemaking, the first edition, Professor Proust and mine, and the second and third edition, which were Professor Berg's and mine, a very, what we thought, a rational plea, and the plea has not changed, for improving uh, California white table wines with generic names, and also with improving California red wines with generic names. And I will lecture on the red wines uh, a week from Monday. Today I'll lecture on the white wine. What we recommended in, uh, in uh, the technology was that 
California Chablis should be on the lower alcohol side and the higher acid side. And that California Sauterne, and it should be dry. And that California Sauterne should be on the less acid side and the slightly higher alcohol and could have some sweetness or a little sweetness. And we thought this would take care of the two needs as we saw it in the generic wine industry. And then we'd, this would get rid of California White Chianti and uh, all the other uh, white table wines that we had on the market. Well, it didn't turn out that way. And if we were going to rewrite it, if we ever do a fourth edition, I'll probably do the same thing, but uh, we'll recommend that Chablis be the drier and tartar wine, and that Rhine be the sweeter and less tart type. That will not be wholly satisfactory, but at least that will provide two types. If they were uniform, the public could have a great deal more confidence in them. They could know what they're going to get when they go to the market and so forth. But neither one have happened. Now we have Chablis that are 4% sugar on the market. California Chablis that are 4% sugar. We have Rhines at 3 and 4% sugar. We also have Chablis that are dry as a bone and flat, and Chablis that are dry as a bone and tart. And we have Rhines that are dry as a bone and tart, and we have Rhines that are dry as a bone that are flat. So we have at least six different kinds of white wine, table wines in California, all of which are overlapping in names and so forth. The name Sauterne, however, is gradually disappearing, I'm happy to note. So we backed the wrong horse there. We should have backed the Rhine and not the Sauterne. How did we know at that time? There was more Sauterne being made than Rhine, but now there's more Rhine being made than Sauterne. The real problem here is getting industry agreement. One person wants his Chablis sweet, the next one wants his dry. And that is the discouraging thing about that. Even more discouraging is that some people have changed. Some rather large producers have changed. They started out to making their Chablis dry, and now they're making them sweet. And that's a sort of retrograde uh, movement. All right, then we'll see you here Monday. The quizzes are here. Uh, the lab reports are here. A, B, D, H, M, P, R, and T. And now I have a few more in the corner here from the handbag from Arthur H. Nathan. Nathan? Burden?